Hello, I'm Deacon Pedro, and welcome back to our continued series during this time of pandemic, Faith in a Time of Crisis. For the last couple of months, we've been speaking with bishops and faith leaders from all over as we try to come to terms to this crisis. And today, as we come to an end of this series, we thought we would travel to Quebec City and speak to the Primate of Canada, Cardinal Gerald Lacroix, Archbishop of Quebec. Monseigneur, it's good to have you in the program. Thank you, Deacon Pedro. Very happy to be here. So I thought that maybe as, as some of our viewers might not be familiar with the Archdiocese of Quebec, uh, can you tell us a little bit about the Archdiocese? What, what's unique, what's different about the Archdiocese of Quebec? Well, we are a, uh, a faith community that goes back way, way, way back. Uh, the Diocese of Quebec was the first founded, established here in Canada in, in north of Mexico in the Spanish colonies. Uh, the gospel arrived here officially, I would say, at the beginning of the 17th century. Quebec City was founded in 1608. The first missionaries arrived in 1615, a branch of the Franciscans, the Recollets. Ten years later, the Jesuits, 1639, Augustine nuns and Ursuline nuns and so on and so forth. 1659, the first bishop, Francois de Laval. Uh -huh. And so we've got almost 350 years of history, our diocese was recognized, established by the Pope in 1674. Mm -hmm. In a few years, we'll be celebrating the 350th. Yes. So today, uh, most of our diocese, which used to be most of North America, has been uh, given up to other regions and are now other dioceses. We used to go down to Louisiana, can you imagine? Yes. Quebec furnished bishops and priests all the way down to the West Coast and to Oregon and all of that. But now our community is about one million Catholics. Okay. We are organized in 241 small communities, which are grouped in 38 parishes. Mm -hmm. Evidently, some parishes have 10 and 15 uh, little communities. And... Uh, we're still a vibrant community, uh, like many others in the province of Quebec. Uh, our people are growing older, but there's some hope. There's a lot of hope because the Lord is faithful. He sustains us as we continue the mission here. Yes. Um, yes, I was going to say that it, it north of Mexico City, this would have been the only diocese in North America. Yes. But, and that's why, that's why I'm the primate, the first, yes. the first, the first. Uh, diocese. It's a... It's a it's a non-horrific title, but it's a beautiful historic title, which says this is where it started. This is the cradle of Catholicism, of Christianity in, in North America. Mm -hmm. so we're very proud of that. Yes. yes. Are, there, are there many remote or mission dioceses? You mentioned that some parishes have, or some communities have various parishes. Yes, uh, and, yes, absolutely. Yes, we have, I would say almost half our population is in, in Quebec City or other few big cities. And the other half of our million Catholics baptized uh, are in rather small urban areas. Mm -hmm. uh, it's about uh, a five hour drive from one end to the other in, in our diocese, which is a lot, but it's not a lot if you compare yourself to the Nunavut and the Northwest Territories and you yes, where they have to that, fly. You know? Yes, yes, yes. But still. Uh, it's, it's a big diocese. We have a big, big family. Right. And we, obviously it's predominantly a French speaking diocese. Yes. Uh, we have one English speaking uh, parish and we have one uh, Spanish speaking community inside of one parish. So all the right. rest French Canadians. Yes. Yeah. Now, as far as I guess the, the city of Quebec or the, the regions that are included in the archdiocese, and maybe even the whole province, how has the last three months in terms of the, of the virus have affected the whole province or the city of Quebec? Yeah, well, you know, Deacon Pedro, uh, the province of Quebec was hit very, very hard. More than half of all the cases uh, of the COVID-19 were here in our province. Can you imagine mm -hmm. that? It's, uh, yes. it's not a, a very interesting trophy that we have right now. And most of our people who were 
affected by the, by the virus or passed away from this virus are elderly people who, have, who are in homes, uh, in hospitals, and long care, long-term care. So that has been quite a shock, you know. We have a lot fewer cases of people who are not in these homes, but I would say, or probably over, I don't have the exact statistics, but way over 80% of the people affected and those who died were in, uh, in homes for the elderly. Mm-hmm. So that is, uh, is, is quite, a, quite a, a difficulty that we've been going through, yes. The whole province has been affected. Some regions, more remote regions, have very few cases. Right. Montreal, the, the region of Montreal, was the hardest hit, very, mm-hmm. very hard. To hit. Mm-hmm. It's, a, it's a big city on a small yeah. island. People are close and uh, people travel a lot. And so I guess mm-hmm. it was more, uh, they were more exposed, yeah. W- would the restrictions have been the same as in most large, largely populated regions where cl- churches closed, masses canceled? Yes. Well, actually, the, the, the Catholic bishops of Quebec decided to close the churches even before the government made it mandatory. Okay. Because we saw, uh, from what we were seeing elsewhere in the world, uh, in Italy and in, in other countries of Europe, how this virus was very, very, very difficult. Mm-hmm. And we wanted to protect our, our population, our faithful, but also our ministers and people who work in parishes. So we started by closing all our churches for one weekend, but rapidly we, uh, the government decided that everything needed to close. So we closed uh, and we just opened up on June 22nd, actually. Okay. Uh, and we, can, we still have quite a few restrictions. We can only have up to 50 people in church at a time, at the right. present time. We can't have gatherings bigger than that, but at least we're starting again to, to celebrate and welcome our people. We've got a, a, lot, a lot of people waiting for funerals also that we haven't. I was going to ask you about funerals or baptisms. Where, so everything was canceled? Yes, absolutely. We have uh, this summer uh, in, in just our diocese of Quebec, we had 650 marriages that were scheduled. Most of the couples have decided to postpone until next year because mm-hmm. it's not just the church you have to reserve and, and prepare for, the, for the, the sacrament. You have to reserve for also for the wedding yes. and, and everything else. And so it was just too complicated and we didn't know if it was going to be possible. So uh, yes. most marriages are postponed. So that's we've been accompanying these couples who have been going through a hard time also. Yeah, I was scheduled to to officiate two marriages this summer as well, and they were they were uh, postponed till next summer. Um, this is also the time of the year where there's a lot of confirmations, uh, ordinations. Yeah. All those have had to be postponed as well, correct? Absolutely, all the confirmations of uh, of young people and of adults. We have a lot of adults here who mm-hmm. are prepared for confirmation. Uh, that has been uh, postponed for now. Uh, until we can have gatherings, because these are not just uh, uh, sacraments we celebrate with one or two persons. These are family events, they're community events. Yeah. The community can't be there, it's rather difficult. Uh, we have not yet baptized uh, the uh, the catechumens that went through the RCIA program. We're preparing to do that in the next weeks. Uh, the, the pastors will do that in their parishes with small communities. Mm-hmm. But I was able to ordain uh, on June 24th, the feast of St. John the Baptist, uh, yeah. three priests and three deacons. That was a blessing. Can you imagine these, uh, these gentlemen decided not to wait? They could have waited, but until when? We don't know when this will be possible to have their families and their communities. Yeah. And they said, you know, Cardinal, uh, the mission of the church needs us now in this time of crisis. We, we can see our families later. They will make that sacrifice, but we want to be ordained now so we can join the pastoral teams and be there uh, helping out in parishes and where we're needed. Mm-hmm. We're younger, we can do this. And so I thought that was pretty noble of them, you know, to, to do that. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Did you, you mentioned that uh, the bishops of Quebec decided, even before the province decided to close things down to, to, to make some changes. Did you find that there was good communication between government officials and church officials as decisions were being made? 
the uh, you want a you want a political answer or you want the truth? <laughs> Well, <laughs> I know it's been different in different jurisdictions. Yes, yes. Listen, uh, to be very honest with you, it was very difficult to establish a good dialogue. Mm. It was about two months before we were able to get a good contact, and we started a very good dialogue. What we did, is we gathered all the religious leaders uh, of the different faith communities in the province, Catholics, mm. Anglicans, uh, uh, evangelicals, uh, Jewish, Muslims, and uh, we all gathered the leaders to see how we're going to enter into dialogue uh, with the officials of the government and of the health, uh, the health people. And uh, when we established a, a dialogue, it went well, but then after the government decided not to implement all that we had prepared for protocols and uh, they, in a unilateral way, decided uh, uh, not to announce the opening of, uh, of, our, uh, of our churches and mosques and synagogues. And, and uh, although they had accepted that we could do gatherings of 50 people or less in public spaces, so we decided that, well, that's enough. That's all we need. We can do that. We start with that. So that is something after all this is over that we need to, to sit down and look at. It's not mm. normal for elected officials not to respect the, uh, uh, the faith communities, not to take better care. I mean, we're hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people in this province, mostly Catholics, but of other religions also, mm. and we need to be respected. That is part of the Charter of Rights, and the government has to see that we are respected. We don't want any privileges. We don't need privileges, but we need to be respected and treated equally. Mm -hmm. So we think that there's been a little bit of discrimination, but we're going to work on that. You know, we're happy that we can start opening things, and but this is this is an issue we need to deal with uh, honestly with with the officials in the near future. Right. Can you tell us a little bit how how the process was in terms of developing the guidelines for resuming mass? I know that's also very different depending on on what uh, diocese or province you're at. Sure. Well. All the bishops of Quebec, we, uh, we had a meeting and we started with uh, working on this and seeing how we would have something general for the whole province. And then each diocese looked at it and decided if there was a rural community or an urban community, if it was a small or large, to see how that could be adapted. But we, uh, we agreed on the general things and then each parish sees in each diocese what are the specifics that need to be taken care of. It's, it's a lot of work, you know, to open a church uh, mm -hmm. with all these uh, safety measures. You need also people to welcome, to help people remind them that they need to wash their hands, how mm -hmm. they're going to circulate, how we're going to receive and distribute communion, how we leave church, how we clean between celebrations. I mean, we've never done this before. I mean, this is, this is totally new for all of us, you know. Uh, we see how they do it in restaurants and and, uh, and stores and, and different public places. So, but uh, it's been a lot of work. But people want to come back to the church to celebrate their faith. Uh, we're not made to live in an isolated way. We're made to live as a family, as a community. Christianity is a family, a family faith. It's a faith that brings us together, and we need to take care of each other. So. So we're doing everything we can. I, I think that we've worked very hard and uh, I think that's appreciated. Yeah, it's been quite the, the learning curve in, in, in many respects. What would you say for you maybe personally, um, what was maybe some of the more surprising opportunities that you found during the last three months? Well, I am I'm amazed to see the creativity that I've uh, that I've noticed in our diocese and elsewhere also uh, how uh, pastoral teams, pastors and lay associates who were confined to their homes, to their rectories, how they found new ways to reach out to their people. The good old telephone, you know, mm. this still <laughs> works, you know. <laughs> and then, of course, you've got all of these uh, uh, intelligent phones that they call them, whether it be iPhones and all the rest, and uh, the applications like the one we're using now, whether it be Zoom, Skype, or FaceTime. I I'm really very happy to see how many pastoral teams 
have developed ways to be in touch with their people. Uh, small sharing groups of the gospel on Zoom, uh, uh, celebrations of the Eucharist on FaceTime Live, uh, uh, interactive uh, encounters, meetings, catechesis, uh, follow-ups with couples and, and with families. There's a lot of new stuff that's been going on, and not necessarily by pastors or lay people who have been used to doing this. They really, they really uh, jumped in it and, and discovered how to do it. We've been helping them with our Department of Communications, but it's been a good experience, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, we all realize that all, all of this virtual stuff is very interesting and gives us opportunities, but we don't want to live like this forever. We can continue using means of communication, of course. I mean, how could we live without salt and light media <laughs> and, and others, you know? And uh, we have our own TV here in Quebec and uh, we use our yes. internet. And I mean, it's, it's a tool that we need to work with today, but never will all of this replace meeting in the same face place, to face celebrating yes. our faith together but yeah. in the meantime this has been very helpful yeah another yeah. thing i discovered also is how we need to work a lot more to strengthen uh, the domestic church the families uh, many families suffered through this mm -hmm. not used to living together mom and dad with the kids in the same house for two three months closed in uh, it's been difficult for some, you know, and even for older couples who are used to going out and having social activities either together or with other people. And sometimes the husband goes someplace and the, the wife someplace else. Now they've been together sometimes in the same little apartment for months. It's been difficult. So we need to be able to, to be closer and help our families and couples. But also I mentioned it at the beginning, most of the people affected by this, uh, by this uh, uh, virus, by this coronavirus, are elderly people. This has been a wake-up call for us. We need to find new ways to take better care of our elderly and our, our grandparents and great-grandparents and people who are ill, who are isolated. You know, I discovered something that shocked me. The media said one day, and it's been repeated quite a few times, that 90% of people in homes do not receive any visit. It's true. I had a hard time believing it. I said, it's a mistake. It can't be true. But after hearing it a few times and listening to people who work in, in, in homes for the elderly or hospitals where a long-term care, mm -hmm. I guess it's pretty well, it's pretty true. And it's very sad. That is not admissible for us Christians. We no. need, we need to reach out and take care a better care of our elderly. This is a wake up call for yes, us. It is. Unfortunately, sometimes it takes a crisis for us to realize some important, uh, to learn some important lessons like that one. Yeah. Um, and, and as you said, we are a sacramental people. Do you think that as we slowly phase back into that sacramental life in the parishes, do you think that the church will be able to go back to what it was like before? Or is this forever changed the church and how we worship together? I hope and pray we never go back to what we were before. Do I scandalize you when I say that? Yes, yes. What do you mean? No, we can't go back to where we were before because life has changed. The world has changed. Uh, we have uh, awakened. Uh, our eyes have been opened to new realities and we need to address them. We can't go back to what we were and start over where we were in February or March when things slowed down and stopped. No, uh, we need to be different. Uh, we cannot just take care of the people we have inside our walls, the walls of our church. Yes. We need to take care of all this population that the Lord has entrusted us that are in our care. You know, I told you at the beginning of this interview that I have a million Catholics in my diocese. Do you think all million, all million of them are in church every Sunday? Do you think they're all married and, 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 and growing in their faith? I mean, it's not up to me to judge, but from what I see, I would say that not more than three or four percent are church goers. I say that very sadly, uh, Deacon Pedro. It's not, it's not a, a proud thing to say, on the contrary. But I think this is a wake-up call to become a more missionary church. Mm -hmm. We cannot just take care of those who come to us and come celebrate. 
We can't just preach yeah. to the choir. We need to preach to the world. Go out to the world and preach the good news. Go, yes. go. Go yes. and preach. Go and baptize. Go and have people grow in their faith. So we need to get our, our, uh, our, our things straight and our priorities straight. And this missionary aspect, which Pope Francis continuously invites us to, 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 to do, Right. It's it's time we stop talking about it and say yes. it's important. It's got to be a priority. This is urgent. We need to. We've got to stop saying that and start doing it. Yeah, it's and true. I and I think uh, yeah. that's why we can't go back to what we were. Yeah. You know. I, again, again, I'm fortunate how it takes a crisis for us to to learn that lesson. And I'll never forget one of the the, the things that I've heard you say probably the last time I was in Quebec City when you said, you know, what time is it? It's time it, to evangelize. It's time to evangelize. Yes, it is. Absolutely. I repeat that often because uh, yeah. that's what the church has been telling us. Do you remember? Oh, you're too young. Maybe you don't remember that. 1990, <laughs> 10 years before the great Jubilee, Pope John Paul, St. John Paul II, yeah. launched a decade of evangelization, a decade to prepare ourselves for the Jubilee of new evangelization. Yeah. What have we done? We're 30 years after this, and, and our, 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 our Quebec, and I would say our Canada, is less and less Christian. Yeah. Yeah. Our world is more secularized than ever. Mm. I mean, we have Christian roots here, but we're not seeing new sprouts. We're not seeing new life. Uh, and that's not yeah. what the Lord is calling us to do. So we need to get our act together. I mean, I'm saying this in a very casual way. But uh, yeah. me, that's what we, we're working on, and we need to we need to renew our personal relationship with the Lord. We need to continue letting the Lord transform us and having a new Pentecost experience, so we can open our doors and our windows and go out, yes, out to this world. Yes. And uh, you know, we we we've been confined now for three months. Now we're opening up. Let's not confine ourselves again inside our walls. Mm -hmm. that we're not sent just to be inside our churches and our yes. rectory halls and all of this. We need to be out yes. in the world Go and the world needs that. to hear the good news and see witnesses. That's yes. you and me and all the rest of us uh, Christians. So That's it. That's it. The, yes. the doors of the church have to be opened. Those are, it, it, you, you, I, I, I do take these words from you as encouragement, not as, as scolding. Um, did you find that that was the message that you that you felt you had to give the people of your archdiocese throughout the last couple of months? That that was the encouraging message. Was there another message of encouragement? Well, I, well, I wasn't as strong as I am with you today, because when you're going through a crisis that affects you so much, we had a lot of people who were more depressed, who were mm -hmm. very worried. It's not time to it's not time to speak harshly. Yes. We have to be good and listen and encourage. I had a lot of messages of encouragement, inviting people to respect what the, uh, what the health authorities, what our government was asking us to do, to save lives, to not contaminate other people or have them contaminate us with this, uh, this COVID-19. We, were, we, were, we tried to have a very hopeful message. Mm -hmm. But as we start coming out of this, we need to see how we're gonna, how we're gonna react and what will be our priorities. And that's where we are now. So uh, now I think yeah. we need to speak a little louder, not to scold, or not to scold, but to exhort. Exhort, to that's the word. Exhort is much better than scold. I'm not a scolder, <laughs> but, I, 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 but because the, the gospel doesn't scold us too often, but it exhorts us really to, to be missionaries and to, to share the good news that is making us filled with hope and joy. Mm -hmm. The joy of the gospel is to be shared. It is true. It is and true so with a that, smile. That's what we're doing. Yeah. Do you do you think that this has been a time, an especially good time for us to grow in our faith? Yes. You know, there are challenges. This is a crisis, but this is also a time of opportunity, a time of opportunities. Uh, a lot of my colleagues, bishops or priests, deacons, even lay people have told me, you know, uh, Cardinal, uh, these months have given me more time to reflect and to pray. I've had more time to pray with the, with the divine office, the word of God, my rosary, silent prayer than before. We, we, don't, we run so much. We're always on a very busy schedule, and we think that what we're doing is so important that we have no time, not enough time. For others, 
and not enough time for the Lord often. So uh, I think we've discovered that, that we need to do that. That's the first point. Be rooted in Christ, rooted in the Word of God, rooted in a personal relationship that renews us, that gives us every morning when we get up what we need to be good shepherds and good and good disciples of Jesus Christ. So that's where we're at right now. And I think that's a great opportunity. Now we need to sit down together and say, what is the Holy Spirit telling our church? What is the Holy Spirit telling our community where we need to go from here? We read the Acts of the Apostles all through the Paschal season. Yeah. I love the Acts of the Apostles Me in too. those days because we see how they dealt with crisis and challenges and difficulties and persecution and all the rest. And the, gross, the gospel grew and the word of God made progress and communities were born and, and Christians were rooted in the Lord. I mean, that's, that's what we look to, you know? So, yes. you know, you said, uh, what's the name of this program? You call it? Uh, Faith in a Time of Crisis. Isn't that the story of our life, that, Pedro? That's the story of the church, yes. It's the story of the church, and it's the story of our life. Mm -hmm. Crisis make us grow as much as good events, you know, if we know how to go through them. Mm -hmm. I mean, how many times people have said, wow, this crisis in my life is an eye-opener. It was an opportunity for me to change, you know. I just experienced something like this. I was operated. I had a surgery in early January, a bariatric surgery. My weight was way, way too, uh, way, way too important, and my health uh, could have deteriorated, deteriorated rapidly. And my doctor had been speaking to me about this for quite a while. And I took the decision last year, and I, I went through the surgery in January, and that requested three months of convalescence after, uh -huh. very strict convalescence, not just to let the stomach heal, uh, because they take a part of your stomach out, but to, to, to really readjust to a new form of living. So that was a crisis for me, but what an opportunity. I feel great today. I've lost a few pounds, um, more than a few pounds, but uh, I'm healthier and I'll be able yes. to serve in, in better conditions, God willing, you know? So, yes. but we live in a spiritual way also, a crisis that can be opportunities if we take them seriously. Mm -hmm. The Lord does not abandon us. He's with us and he's always pointing ahead. Go ahead, go ahead, always. advance, yes. go in the deep. Yes, and allowing the crises so that uh, he can stretch us and help us grow. Um, Cardinal Gerald Lacroix, uh, Archbishop of Quebec, has been, been so good uh, hearing you, seeing you today and, and hearing those words of encouragement and exhortation as we return back to normal. But as you said, not the way it used to be, but the way we should be, which is a missionary sure. church. Sure, um, sure. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you very much. And don't forget the time. It is time to evangelize. Time to evangelize. God bless and to all those who are listeners today, all your faithful Thank you. salt and light. Continue your great work. God bless you. Thank you. Cardinal Gerald Lacroix, Archbishop of Quebec. He joined us from his office in Quebec City. And that brings us to the end of our program today. Remember to continue visiting our website, saltandlighttv.org, for more articles and videos during this time of crisis. And most importantly, remember that despite the crisis, we can always grow in our faith and you can always find hope and faith in the midst of the crisis. <laughs>